Welcome to Orange City United Methodist Church. Those of you who are watching online, we are so glad you're joining us today. Please be sure to mark your calendars for 5th Sunday Combined Service on July 31st. We will also have a town hall meeting immediately following service in the sanctuary to talk about the future of our church. You will notice on the connect cards in the bulletins we made a slight change. For the next couple of weeks, if you have questions that you would like to have answered at the town hall meeting, you can submit them on the connect cards. You can also email your questions to Pastor Ryan at ocumc.org. The OCUMC Kids Summer Days program has been a hit. We have a ton more fun scheduled for July. We need more volunteers if you would like to help. If you would like to help, please contact Heidi Stephens. We will be hosting our annual planning retreat on Saturday, July 30, in the youth building from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Please feel free to join us if you are interested in helping plan or have input on the events and activities that we will be scheduling for the next year. Martha's Cupboard just posted a six-month report. If you would like to take a look at the report, it will be posted on or near the bulletin board in the narthex. They have been blessed to have been able to help so many families over the last few months and the program continues to grow with more and more families coming each week. Your continued donations and support are appreciated as they move forward to in having to purchase pantry items from Second Harvest and other sources now that the grant awarded Second Harvest is coming to an end. That allowed us to receive many of these items at no cost over the last three months. And we are so grateful to have been provided with so many items to help our community. We are starting our back to school supply drive this month to help collect school supplies for Orange City Elementary School. You will find the supply list in the narthex as well as donation boxes. We will be collecting items through August 9th and delivering everything to the school on August 10th. If you have any questions, please contact Heidi Stevens. We were saddened to hear of former pastor Paul Kelly's passing this week. He was the pastor here at our church from 2005 to 2007. And now let us worship God together by affirming our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the li and life everlasting. Amen. And our call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? O oh Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. Good morning. Our opening hymn is number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
Now we come into a time of service where we hear and we ask God to hear our prayers. So now I ask that you would think of those persons in your life who need healing or need a lift up, a prayer of lift up this morning. I pray you think of those persons. And if you'd like to, as we go into this time of prayer, please say their names out loud as God hears all of our prayers. So now I ask that you now enter with me in this time of prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity to get together, to get together, to gather as your church in this beautiful sanctuary. We thank you for the gift of worship. God, we love you. And we thank you for the ways that you walk with us each and every day. Help us to see your guiding hand as it leads us through the next day and the next. Help us to be your hands and your feet. Wherever we go, help us to bring love to the people around us. Help us to bring healing. Help us to bring hope, peace, love, and joy. We pray for those who who we know that are sick, who are hurting. We pray that you bring them healing. We pray that you bring them comfort and peace. And God, we pray for our country, for the continued healing of our land. We pray for peace. We pray for all of us to unite under the banner of love. God, we pray for your kingdom to come in this world and for us to help establish it here. God, we thank you for all the ways in which you work. God, speak to us today. Speak to our hearts so that we can be changed to look more like your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the witness that he leaves behind and the stories that we get to reflect on. God, speak to us. So now I pray that each of us would hear today the word from God. And I pray that our worship be joyous to you. As you look down on us, you love us. And we thank you for your love and your holy name that we pray. Amen. This time I ask for children to come forward for our children time. Good morning, everyone. Oh, hey, Aiden. Come on over. <clears throat> How are you doing? It's been a while, huh? So my message today is about pride. And we're going to start off. Do you like bubble gum? I like bubble gum, too. Pastor Ryan, you like bubble gum? Yes. He likes bubble gum, too. And you know what? Pastor Ryan is really good at blowing bubbles. So I have asked Pastor Ryan to come up to be my volunteer today to blow a bubble for me, because I want him to show you how good he is, okay? And just off topic, I want to thank my volunteers on Friday, speaking of volunteers, for coming to help out Parents' Night Out. It was a great night, and we had a lot of kids, a lot of fun, a lot of energy from these kids. So thank you very much for coming. So I want to talk to you about bubblegum and pride. So do you know what pride is? It's kind of one of those words we hear it, we think we know what it means, but there's a lesson into pride. Pride can be good, like I drew a great picture, I won the spelling bee. But pride can also be bad, like it's, you know, I know everything and I am the best at what I do. I'm even better than God. That's a bad pride. It's not something people like to hear. So let's say that pride is like a bubble, okay? You keep chewing it, you keep blowing it, it gets bigger. But what happens when you boast too much bad pride? Do you know what happens when, when that? There's going to be somebody to go, well. See, he's, he's, he's showing off because he likes to show. But when you have too much pride, <laughs> somebody will come pop your bubble. <laughs> and they'll bring you down and let you know, oh, it's not some good words we're using. So we need to make just better choices in our words and be mindful of our words and not be overly excited to tell all about us and what we do. 
Instead, we just need to show them with kindness and show them our special talents and use our special talents to tell people. All right, so we're just say a little prayer here. Dear God, thank you for all the gifts that you give to us. We are grateful for all the special talents you give each one of us when we were created. We pray you help us to keep us a humble heart and be mindful of our words and our actions. In our, your son's precious name, amen. Thanks, Amy. And thank you, Pastor Ryan. <laughs> our next hymn is Breathe on Me, Breath of God, number 420, all four verses. Please be seated. We're continuing our series of learning about the kings of the Old Testament. And so we're in 2 Kings today, 2 Kings 20, 12 through 19. At the time, King Mordach Baladan, son of Baladan of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah welcomed them. He showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then the prophet Isaiah came to Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? From where did they come from to you? Hezekiah answered, they came from a far country from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Days are coming when all that is in your house, that which your ancestors have stored up to this day, shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons who born to you shall be taken away. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then the king Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not, if there is, will be peace and security in my days. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're continuing our sermon series, as I said, on the kings. And I almost skipped over this because we looked at Hezekiah last week, but, it, this, but the message that it delivers today was something that just kept speaking to my heart. And so I share it with you today. And again, we've been communicating through baseball. I don't know much of you who, who likes and who doesn't like baseball, but in baseball, there is nonverbal communication. A wipe of the brow, a hand across the chest, down the pant leg, all to communicate what our player should do next. Steal home, prepare for a double play. This type of communication started in the 1800s when there was a deaf player and a deaf umpire. 
teams began to see the value of nonverbal communication to send messages that the other team could not decipher. Now, the most important nonverbal communication in the game of baseball is between the, pitch, the pitcher and the catcher. It is one of the catcher's job to know each of the opponent's batter's strengths and weaknesses. He then uses his fingers to tell the pitchers what the pitch they should throw next. He crouches in his stance. He starts pointing fingers at the dirt. And it was common knowledge, all teams knew, that you'd use one finger for a fastball, two for a curve, and three for a changeup. Now, sign stealing became the process by which persons from the other team would see this nonverbal communication, especially between the catcher and the pitcher, and they would interpret it and then communicate it to their fellow teammates, especially the one at the bat. At first, sign stealing was completely legal. Nothing was done about sign stealing, but as it always does, the sign stealing got more and more ingenious, which blurred the lines of cheating. What is the value of sign stealing, you may ask? If a batter knows what's going to be thrown at him, he can be better prepared to hit the ball or do nothing at all. So I said it was first legal and almost everyone did it. There are some ingenious things that they did to steal signs and give their team the edge. Teams would hide players in inconspicuous places, in the wall of the outfield, in the scoreboard, in the clubhouse. The very first year of baseball, one ingenious team built a shack on a telegraph pole high above the stadium where they put someone with binoculars. They would then communicate this through buzzers hidden in the dirt and they would send Morse code to the person at bat. The things that they think of. But as you know, technology is always getting better. Then with a telephoto lens in 1950s, all teams, all they had to do was watch the TV broadcast or listen to the radio as the announcers told what the pitch was going to be thrown next. And it was about this time that Major League Baseball made sign stealing through mechanical devices illegal. No more cameras, radios, binoculars, no more using buzzers in the field. Anything other than nonverbal communication was illegal. You could still use hand signals and players could try to communicate through to the batter, but it was hard to see that far. It was like looking at the 50 yard line to the end zone in football to try to see how many fingers someone is holding up. But yet teams, they always found a way to sign steal. In 2000, they, they made the rule more specific, no more or sign stealing through technological, this meant cell phones, but yet sign stealing became and still is a problem, the biggest problem happened just a few years ago with the Houston Astros who had sent had their World Series taken away. They had a secret camera that pointed straight at the catcher. Anytime the pitcher was going to throw a fastball, they didn't do anything. But then when anything else was thrown by the catcher, when they said two fingers, three fingers, or four fingers, they took out a bat and they hit plastic trash cans twice, bang, bang. And you could, and as you watch videos, you can clearly see and hear this was a big deal in baseball when it came out. People were let go, players were suspended, and they weren't the only ones caught of using sign stealing. My own team, the Red Sox, they used the Apple Watch to communicate signs to their batters. So you see, sign stealing is a long tradition of baseball. It rewards ingenious cheaters if they can get away with it. Our Old Testament story today tells of a story of a nation who sent some Stein stealers to Israel so they could better prepare to conquer Jerusalem. You know, we're getting closer and closer each and every day towards Jesus, where all of Israel is conquered, and then they return back to their lands. But today we're here with the, but with the, king, with the kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom has already been taken away by the Assyrians. And so the enemy was of Israel was there was two of them at this point, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Last week we saw as the kingdom of Judah, they, their power of prayer held off the, the powerful Assyrian army that conquered their kin to the, to the north. And today we look at the king, King Hezekiah, as we did last week. After being healed by God, he becomes prideful. He allows these sign-stealing Babylonians to enter his kingdom that later led to their destruction, and they were hauled away as well as the northern, the, the southern kingdom, the northern, the northern kingdom. 
It would be like today if, if, bank, if a bank gave a group of thieves the inside blueprints of their building that told them every door code and exactly where to go to, abas- to bypass all alarms or security. But we see today that hum- Hezekiah, he continues to hum- humble himself, and this is how he was also always known as a good king, when other kings, not so much. They may, have, they may have started well, but then they ended up doing evil, but not Hezekiah. And again, a quick recap last week, King Hezekiah was the king of the southern kingdom. He had a strong faith. He led his people, connected to God, and upheld the laws of Moses. This happened when he was, was deathly ill, the greatest army was looking to destroy him. He always fell on his face before God. But again, he becomes prideful. This is where we are today. Our story is told in multiple books of the Bible. It's told in Isaiah. In fact, the story that we read today is identical in Isaiah chapter 39. It's also told in the book of 2 Chronicles from our Bible. In 2 Chronicles, it says this about what was happening And so the matter of the envoys of the princes of Babylon, who had been sent to him to inquire about the sign that had been done in the land. God left the king to himself in order to test him and to know all that was in his heart. And as we see from our story today, Hezekiah was tested and his pride won the battle within his heart. And so we ask, what was it exactly that Hezekiah did? We know that he gave the Babylonians, the blueprint of the kingdom, but what was what he did sinful? Hezekiah, as he walked with his enemy, he didn't know his enemy, but walked him through the kingdom, he took credit for all that God had given him. He took credit for his riches, his success, even his healing. Hezekiah showed them all that he had done to make himself the richest, the most successful, and even impervious to disease. As he led the Babylonians, he wanted to show them just how good he was, just how successful he was, how rich he was, rather than tell them how God had blessed them, how his faith in God protected him. Hezekiah wanted to show his guests that he was the greatest. Even after all of this, Hezekiah, as we saw, as we see in our scripture, he is known to be a good king. And this is because, as we shall see, He responds as his weakness is revealed to him by others. Now, I don't usually talk much about our interaction with sin because one of the things that I think the church does too much of is point the finger at you and tell you how unworthy you are, how much you need the grace of God because without it, you're worthless. Now, a lot of my upbringing in the church, I grew up feeling like this, that if I didn't repent and repent often, I would be worthless. This is how I approached the communion table, as I reflected on all the ways I had sinned against God. I grew up being fearful of being like one of those teenagers that my parents always talked about, or the ones that my youth director used as examples. In my heart, there was an abundance of guilt as I wrestled with hormones and cravings and my wild side, and yes, I was pretty wild, a tendency to think before or act before thinking, but A lot of teenagers are that way, but I wrestled with guilt in the church. The older I got, though, the more theologically trained I became, I realized that guilt serves no purpose in our Christian walk. I learned the joy of repentance, where God reveals how he's working to make us better people if we work with the Holy Spirit and repent of when we get it wrong. God reveals our weaknesses to show us how he is perfecting us, not so that we can dwell on how sinful we are, We're all sinners. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We know that scripture. We wrestle with different things that are contrary to the the character of God. But we're also in the process of transformation by Jesus, our perfecter. So while we may struggle with different things, greed, lust, gluttony, whatever else, the important thing is we are being transformed from the insight to the image of God day by day. And it isn't something that we stand by and watch or feel guilty about how long it's taking. It is something we take part in with God as he transforms our heart. God shows us our sin and we respond by noticing the things in our heart and mind that lead us to sin. We retrain, we remove things that 
or circumstances that lead us down the path of sinfulness. And with sin, we always put ourselves first. Above everyone else, our wants, our needs, our desires, they come first from everybody, whether we realize this or not. As I mentioned, there are many things that are defined as contrary to the character of God. There are many sins out there. We can name them. Pride, though, is at the heart of them all. There is one author who I love to read. says that pride is the root of every sin, and every sin can be traced back to pride. The pastor named Floyd McClung, in his book Follow, he says that every sin we try to go our own way, and then we fight for justification within ourselves. He quotes James 4 and calls us to humbleness before God. Pride is something that we all struggle with. In my own life, pride is something that always sneaks back in. It always comes back. Most of us, we don't think we fall victim to pride. We look at the sins of Hezekiah in our story today and immediately recognize how pride took over his heart. And we see how different we are than he was. Even as I reflected on this story, I thought, how am I like Hezekiah? I don't have riches. I, don't, I haven't won any battles. I don't like to brag about my accomplishments. How am I prideful? But then I got a hold of an article by a man uh, named Ronald McDonald. Not that Ronald McDonald. I try to figure out who he was, but all I could find was just a wise Christian. He said there are several different types of pride, and we all suffer from it. He said, a friend of mine the other day told me how I was a prideful man, and I said to myself, he's just jealous. So I told my wife, and, and she said, oh, come on, you're a humble man, seriously. You're not cocky or flashy or arrogant. But later the same week, I was reading a book that said the most prideful people aren't usually the ones who are bra bragging arrogant. They are the nice, friendly ones, the helpful ones at work. He then describes the typical definition of pride, the one we use to best just define Hezekiah, someone who's flashy and arrogant and cocky. But then he said there are other ways that pride can sneak into our thoughts, and they're just as sinful as Hezekiah. And so I will share with you there are times in my own life where pride slips into my thoughts. You know, I grew up as an average person. I was never in the top 25% of my class. Neither was I in the lower 50%. I just knew I was average. I didn't graduate with honors. I was on the soccer team, but I was never a soccer star. In fact, I came off the bench more times than not. However, after I graduated seminary, I felt like I gained a couple of IQ points. I gained a self-awareness that I didn't have before. I became able to gain and retain knowledge like I hadn't done before. In seminary, I felt smart, where I hadn't really felt that way before. I was asked to student teach a class, and I felt really good about myself and who I was. So after seminary, from time to time, pride sneaks into my life to think that I know better. My understanding and situation is better than yours, because I am more self-aware, I may say. I believe that I may have some more common sense. In my own mind, I will say, let me take this opportunity to teach you. Now, this happens in my marriage sometimes, and I always have to find the strength to, to apologize for my pride. But it happens in friendships and relationships as well. This is a, pride, this is a definition of pride that I like. Pride happens when we do or say things for the purpose of people praising ourselves, or for making ourselves feel good, putting ourselves ahead of someone else's self. Pride wants ourself to be praised and get the glory, be worshipped, and be highly talked about, even when we're not in the room. Unhealthy pride can give us an elevated view of our own self that's not accurate, but we truly start to believe it and act to reinforce what we've come to believe is true. In my own moments of pride, I believe that my seminary education and the work that I had done to deeply examine myself, my character flaws, to my talents, all of that translates in my brain to I am smarter. We think of Jesus as he teaches the, the disciples on humbleness. Don't be like the Pharisees, he says. Don't pray in the streets for all to see. Don't let your body show that you are fasting. Pray in secret and God will reward you. Wear oil on your head and so no one will know that you are fasting. And that there are several different types of, of pride that leads us down sins. My pride may be different than yours. 
One pride is pride of spirituality or pride of humbleness, where you brag about how much you give away. At least I'm not like the sinners. We can relate to Jesus' story or Jesus' parables when he talks about those who say, at least I'm not like those. People like this, they wrestle with guilt, and they think more often than not that, I, that they are not worthy, but they try to make others see how worthy they are. Prideful people can skillfully brag about how humble they really are. Prideful people can skillfully brag about how humble they really are. Then there's pride of knowledge, which is me. You feel like you have all the answers. At worst, people with this type of pride have a problem with cutting people off. They have a counter response ready. It can be hard to learn from others. They think they know it all from one subject, or maybe they know it all. Maybe you know someone like that. Then there's pride of power. A pride shows itself in a person who has to be obeyed. Keeping and enforcing the rules are really important. They try to convince people to do things from a moral standpoint. They have a hard time recognizing when someone is better, and they have a hard time saying thank you. Now, it can be easy to convince ourselves that pride isn't something that we wrestle with. But as you can see, it can sneak into our thoughts in many different ways and lead us towards sinfulness. But as we become aware of our tendencies towards pride, we can approach God in prayer who sends the power of Jesus and the con conviction of the Holy Spirit to perfect us. One thing I asked this story this week, if Hezekiah became so prideful that the Lord protected him, he healed him, he blessed him, and then he becomes so prideful that he shows his enemies everything, how does the historical record still have him as a king who started and ended doing good in the sight of the Lord? As I said, there's multiple sources of our scripture that give us an account of the story today. And so I went back to Second Chronicles, and it said this, In those days, Hezekiah became sick. It was at the point of death. He prayed for the Lord, and, and he answered and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not respond according to the benefit to him, for his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came upon him, upon Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride in his heart. Both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon him in the days of Hezekiah. We remember King Solomon. In his conversation with God, he asks for wisdom. Second Chronicles shows us that God says to Solomon, If my people who called on my name, if they humble themselves, they pray and seek my face, they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive them and heal their land. Hezekiah was not known as a good king because he was less of a sinner than everyone else and all the other kings. Hezekiah was known as a good king because he was like King David. He always found a way to fall in his face in prayer for all the things, especially the things that he did that were sinful. Now Hezekiah became prideful because all the ways that Lord had blessed him. Over and over, the Lord blesses Hezekiah, which led to his pride. But as soon as Isaiah points this out to him, the story tells us that he prays to the name of the Lord to humble him, which, as we learn, God always responds and forgives him and leads him to do much good. The lesson that we learn from Hezekiah is always to be on the lookout for pride in our hearts. It can be like a disease in our body. At first, it goes unrecognized, and you become more aware of it. Something doesn't feel right. You may wonder, why am I struggling to agree with a certain person? Why am I taking so long to say I'm sorry? Why do I not want to be around this person? Why do I not want to forgive this person? This is where we should be searching for our heart for pride as it's starting to sneak in. Then we have two choices. We ask God to root out the pride in our hearts or become stubborn. You know, I almost, as I said, I almost skipped over this story and moved on to the next king in line. But the more I thought about the lesson we learned from Hezekiah, a good and a righteous king who saved his people from the strongest army at that time, who made it his mission to lead people in right relationship, becomes utterly prideful and almost brings ruin on him and his entire kingdom. 
But he finds the strength to go to God in prayer and ask for humbleness, which we see God grants his request and leads him on the path to do much good for many years after this. And so today, let us ask God to humble each of our hearts. However pride takes its roots in our minds, we ask God to humble us because God is always at the center of our hearts, always there looking to perfect us. Every day we look more and more like Jesus. Every day we become more perfect. And the more we work with him, the more we see where he is working in our lives and making us better people. We also see the things that separate us, but we look for God who is making us a better person. Today, let us pray to be humbled by the power of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, I thank you for the ways that you speak to us, that you work with us. Sometimes, time and time and again, it looks like we fail and all we do is fail. But your love is always present. There is always joy as you look on us, as you look on your children who follow after you, you see the good in us. And we, sometimes we see the bad. So God, I pray that you would show us how each day we're looking more like your son, Jesus Christ. Give us the courage to humble ourselves before you to surrender as you turn us from the inside out. God, we thank you for the ways in which you speak to us. And so today I ask that you'd speak to us and reveal us your love and grace for each one of us because it runs deep. Thank you for your love. Amen. Our next hymn is number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, All Four Verses.
Please be seated. And if I have my ushers now to collect the offering this morning. Oh, Lord, we thank you for how you love us each and every day. You love us. God, we thank you for the way you never leave us. God, you're always blessing us, giving us things to be grateful for in our lives. God, today we give back to you. We ask that you would bless all the ways that we serve you. We ask that you would turn all the ways that we've Bless you all the things that we try to do. You would turn them into the kingdom of God around us. Help us to bring love. Help us to bring peace. Help us to bring healing to our families, our loved ones, our community. God, help us to bring the kingdom of God as we work together as the church. Bless now these gifts. May they go to your glory. Amen. For our closing hymn, it's number 419, I Am Thine, O Lord, all four verses.
hear now the benediction. Do not forget that you are loved. That each and every day you are being perfected by God, our perfecter. Go and spread God's love to the world around us. Go. For you are blessed and you are much loved. Amen. Thank you.